Today, we'll study the Word of God under the title, The Life of a Christian. How should we, as Christians, carry out our life with the correct faith to be a good example to the neighbors in our community? We should become the salt and light of the world so that whoever sees our actions will come to think they must surely belong to the Church of God. Therefore, today, let's find out what kind of life we should live as Christians according to the Bible, the prophets, and God. Let's take a look at the teachings of the Bible regarding this matter. First, let us take a look at Isaiah chapter 46. Verse 10 reads, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. God made known the end from the beginning. God allowed us to know the things that are yet to occur and the works He would accomplish. In other words, doesn't it mean that God knows everything about the future? Let us see another verse about this matter, Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. Here, this book refers to the Bible we are looking at now. It says, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. The reason we are reading Isaiah chapter 46 and Revelation chapter 22 is because God, who sees the end from the beginning, commanded us not to add or take anything away from the Bible. We may not fully understand now why God said this. However, just as clearly as we can see each other's faces, the day will come in the near future when we will realize why God commanded us to follow the Bible. The Bible clearly explains the type of life a Christian should live. Although many regard the Sabbath and the Passover as precious, in regard to the teaching about the life of a Christian, they doubt and wonder, is it really a command of God? They merely consider this only as a moral or ethical lesson in the Bible, but it's not. How does the Bible teach us to regard all the words of God? We should not add or take anything away from the Bible. God teaches us to be gentle and kind so we can change into the heavenly citizens who put on righteousness. Some people in the world may say, only fools are gentle and kind. What's the point in living like that? However, whenever it's the Word of God, we must do it. Is not everything that God recorded in the Bible essential for our salvation? Everything in the Bible is essential for us to go to heaven. How about those who are unable to obey this will of God? Isn't that why God said, we must be born again? If you're unsuccessful in your first attempt at being reborn, try again. If your second attempt is unsuccessful, we must try a third time. For example, when Thomas Edison tried to invent the light bulb we use every day, he encountered many failures. He prayed to God after failing, saying, I would like to give light to the whole world. Please let me know what went wrong and grant me a better way to make the light bulb. He prayed continuously, like this, without rest, asking for God's help. Eventually, he invented one of the most indispensable necessities of modern society and illuminated this dark world. Everyone, God, who knows the end from the beginning, wrote every word of the Bible. 
He also commanded us neither to add nor to subtract from it. Therefore, we must not neglect a single word written in the Bible. We must not regard God's instructions and commands by the worldly standards of ethics and morality. Rather, the standard of our judgment must be based on the Word of God. Some may say, God gave this teaching to us so that we can get along with others without fighting. It's not a big deal if we don't do this. When we compare this kind of thinking to Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 to 19, aren't they trying to say that it's okay to add or to take away from the Word of God? What does the Bible say? God will add plagues in proportion to how much was added to the Bible. The right to heaven will be taken away from those who take words away from the Bible. Everyone, the reason we looked at these verses earlier was so that we may acquire this kind of mindset toward the Word of God. There were some cases where believers were criticized by people in the world. He claims to believe in God, yet his personality is so rough. He is so selfish. She doesn't care about anyone else but herself. Of course, these are not examples of our Zion members. We can see many cases where people spoke negatively about those who claim to believe in God. How can they behave like that while claiming to believe in God? How can that kind of person be a believer, let alone become a title holder? It makes me feel uncomfortable just to hear them talk about others like that. This must never happen among our Zion members. If any worldly customs remain, we should change them into heavenly customs. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your… what kind of deeds? Good deeds. They may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Can we add or subtract from these words? We must not. Some may think, according to that verse, I'm doing enough. No, we must never think like this, but rather, obey the gracious teachings of God just as they are. If by chance, we still have any ungracious deeds or actions that could be criticized by the people around us, we should immediately get rid of all our evil deeds, wicked thoughts, and selfishness from today. Keeping in mind God's word, they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Step by step, let us all be reborn with a mature faith as the people of God. Let us turn to Titus chapter 2. If we are Christians, how should we live our lives? If someone says his behavior hasn't changed, even though he became a believer in God, then our behavior has dishonored God. Let us see chapter 2, verse 7. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed, because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them. Talking back is an act of defiance. We should think how we can speak with wisdom instead of talking back. 
Here it says slaves, but we are living in the age where there are no slaves. However, are we not surrounded by hierarchical organizational structures at our workplaces and in society? Unless what your superior tells you to do is something wicked or against the will of God, please obey joyfully without talking back. Verse 10. It says, not to steal from them. This too is a teaching of God in the Bible for Christians. And not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior, how? Attractive. If we do this, people will think, surely someone who lives this kind of life can be called a true believer in God. They are trustworthy and reliable. The Bible teaches us to take the lead in setting good examples. Verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. There is definitely a reason why God asked us to live this kind of life while living in this world. God never asks us to do anything without a reason. God wouldn't ask us to do anything that's not related to our salvation. While living in this world, we must be very careful neither to add nor take away even a single word from the 66 books of the Bible. Even if we lived in a worldly manner until now, since we have come to learn and know God's Word, shouldn't we put them into practice from this moment on? Verse 13. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for Himself a people that are His very own, eager to do what is good. It says that God gives all these teachings and instructions to purify for Himself a people that are His very own. Everyone, are we not all God's people? We are God's people. And what's more, we're also God's children. God gives us this teaching so that we can become God's very own people. Then, we must differentiate ourselves from the people of the world who don't live according to these teachings. Some might ask, isn't it okay to just live morally and ethically without believing in God? That is not okay. As God's people who are in the truth, He is teaching us how to live our lives. The Israelites had to go through the wilderness before entering the land of Canaan. They spent 40 long years in the desert. During that time, God gave them His commands and taught them the importance of the Sabbath day and how to live in obedience to His Word. God did this so that everything would go well for the Israelites when they entered the land of Canaan. Nowadays, while living on the earth, we might think, people around me are cold-hearted, evil, and rude. They're selfish and only care about themselves. Maybe I should act just like them. People of the world belong to the world. But since we belong to heaven, we should live according to God's teachings. God told us to be the salt and light of the world. The role of light is to drive back the darkness, and salt is used as a preservative to prevent things from spoiling. Through the children of Zion, God wants to purify this corrupt world. For this reason, we, as Christians, must definitely live in this way. I hope that we can inscribe this on our hearts at this time. Although we've learned God's commands and laws many times, please read the words about our life as Christians 
in Ephesians chapter 4. In order to grant us salvation, there are many lessons that God has given to us. Even though these lessons are in the Bible, some say, the Bible is only a guide for us to live our day-to-day -day lives while in this world. Does it really have anything to do with our salvation? Such words are nonsense. Everything written in the 66 books of the Bible is related to our salvation. Doesn't the words of the prophecy of this book encompass all the 66 books of the Bible? What happens if anyone adds anything to this book? We must never add our own opinions. Let's do our best to obey God's teachings and make every effort to put them into practice while thinking, what teachings has God given us inside His plan for the salvation of mankind? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Doesn't this mean that we must not live like the Gentiles? Verse 18. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. This means these are the people who live secular lives, roaming aimlessly in the world, separated from God. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. With what? With a continual lust, meaning they are driven by greed. Greed is selfishness. With a continual lust for more. Verse 20. It says, You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. There's a great difference between the teachings that we have received from those that the people of the world have received. It's because we have been taught by God. Then, shouldn't we have the perspective of God's people as those who were taught by Him? You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Verse 21. Surely you heard of Him and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. We must throw away our old way of life, our old self, our old character, our worldly thoughts. Verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Only then can we all enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's continue with verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off… What should we put off? Put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. What should we do? Get rid of all of these. Verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Everyone, as the citizens of heaven, we must live like this. It will be impossible to follow God's will if we quarrel with one another or have a heart full of rage and hatred. Even if these people read the Bible, God's will cannot be delivered into their hearts. They cannot be moved or be inspired. 
Once again, let's reflect upon ourselves. There's a clear reason why we must live our lives this way. We have a good reason for living a godly life. We must not think that we can live as other people do. Once again, I would like to ask all of you not to be swept away by the currents of the world, but always hold on to God's teachings. God gave many precious teachings about families as well. However, from time to time, I see some people who easily ignore these kinds of teachings due to their own perspective and personal feelings. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 reads, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. This is not my own thought or opinion. This is God's Word. Don't you think there's a reason God, who sees the end from the beginning, spoke these words? Nothing was created without God's will, not the heavens, nor the earth, nor anything else in all creation. There must be a reason God gave us this teaching. This is absolutely an essential teaching. Let's continue with verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It says that husbands are to love and cherish their wives just as Christ loved and gave himself up for the church. We must do this. Even though all these teachings are contained in the Bible, because we don't study them often or engrave them on our hearts, we tend to follow the standards set by the people of the world. Don't we need to follow all the teachings of God pertaining even to our families and society? The Bible does say that wives must submit to their husbands in everything and that husbands should love their wives just as Christ loved the church, even being crucified on the cross. Let's see verse 26. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it. Just as Christ does the church, for we are what? We are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must do what? She must respect her husband. In their youth, husbands made many efforts to support their families. We should not neglect them now that they're retired. How should we treat them once they retire? We should say, you have sacrificed so much to feed and support our family. From now on, let's believe in God together and live the rest of our lives comfortably. In the past, when he came home, after a long day's work, he was welcomed by all the family members who said, thank you so much for all your hard work. Don't treat him poorly now just because he's retired and advanced in years. Husbands and wives should treat each other the same both before and after their retirement. Let's contemplate once again, why did God give us this teaching in the Bible? Let's not live like the people of the world but rather set the standard of our lives based on God's words. If we continue with chapter 6, 
we can see God's teachings regarding the relationship between parents and children. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Obeying in the Lord means living a life of obedience with a common faith. Verse 2. Honor, we must what? Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, when you work, don't work to simply win them over when they're watching you. But like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. God granted all these teachings to us, but we tend to ignore them. Even in the world, if you just try to do things half-heartedly, you'll be left out. Everyone, no matter where we live or what kind of people are around us, we should always display the characteristics of the children of God. Salt must never lose its saltiness. Doesn't salt carry out its role as a preservative? Only when it remains salty. That's why God told us to become the salt and the light of the world. Whether it's for the physical or the spiritual world, I hope that we will all be the children of God who can carry out the role of the salt and the light of the world. Let's continue with verse 7. Serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Instead of applying the word slavery here, we can understand this as the relationship between people of higher and lower positions. Even if you're in this type of a relationship, don't just work to win them over, but work as if what you're doing has been entrusted to you by God. Our God teaches us, the children of Zion, to work wholeheartedly. No matter what kind of masters we're working under in the world. Some people wonder Does obeying my superiors really determine whether or not I will enter heaven? Do I really have to obey my superiors? If somebody asks this kind of question, here's how Jesus would answer Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly, what will happen? You will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. There's an important word that we need to focus on in that sentence. What is it? It's the word certainly. It says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Everyone, if we overlook these matters by saying, isn't God just giving us these ethical and moral teachings only to make us good people? Does it really make a difference whether we do this or not? It certainly does. The word, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven, is not my idea nor my opinion. This is a teaching directly from God given to all mankind. So all of us, who are heading to heaven, must live our lives according to these teachings. Let's all become the salt and light of the world and lead many souls into the arms of God. In doing so, let us return all glory to God. By this, I would like to conclude today's sermon. Thank you very much.